Thank you, Michelle. Hi, everyone. So I thought you'd be able to relax if you knew actually how my speech was going to flow. Just to make it easy for you, so there will be peaks and valleys, as you can see. This is just a photograph of a wall of my house. I took all of the doodles, threw them up on the wall so you get a sense of it. I thought you'd be more present if you knew how I was going to communicate and what it was I was going to share. I'm going to be talking about branding and social media and a few other things, but I'm sharing this with you because I believe that if we're both present, if we're both here together in our honest forms, that we will understand each other far better at the end. So this is how I would like to begin. Let's get to those doodles. So the first time I met a computer was because I was diagnosed with severe attention deficit disorder. Now this was in the early 80s, not a diagnosis you wanted in the early 80s. Uh, we were locked in cages and told that we were broken. And so my family was a fairly proactive family. And so we looked for alternatives. And we found an alternative in a lab that was testing a chemical that they would drip into your bloodstream that would normalize you. It would make you more like everybody else so you wouldn't be such an outcast. Now, this was the first time that I saw a computer. And the way that I experienced this machine was they sat me in front of it, put a needle in my arm, dripped this chemical into my system, and I had to trace a little dot with a rectangle that I controlled with a joystick. I had to trace the dot so they could assess how much I was concentrating, how much more like everybody else I was. Well, it didn't help very much. I spent a lot of time in the principal's office. You can sort of see Sad Strauss, right? <laughs> Going to the principal's office. And I have to tell you, he was a nice man, but as I spent that much time with him, I had a lot of time to process. I had to ask myself, how is it that everybody else can sit in class for eight hours and then go to det detention for another hour and not have too much energy, not need to get up and move around? Now, I was thrown out of every single class until I graduated from high school. And while I was sitting in that principal's office all of the time, sometimes I was on the chemical, sometimes I was not. And so I got the chance to think about it. All right, I'm on the chemical. What's going on here? What is happening? OK, fine, I can look down this tunnel. I could focus on this one thing. Great. All right, I'm not on the chemical. What's going on? OK, wait a minute. So there are a lot of lights and people, and there's these drapes, and then there's this D falling off the sign in the background. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on. OK, a lot of energy. The little yellow hat dotting the I. Yes, I know that it is there. Because with attention deficit disorder, this is what happens. All of the signals are present all of the time. All of them. The thing that you didn't know that I knew was that not only were things like this present, but your energy was present. You were telling me things constantly just by being who you were. You know when someone walks into a room and you're like, why are you in such a bad mood? And the person's like, what? what? I didn't even say anything, right? You just know. There's just an energy about them. Well, I'm here to tell you that with attention deficit disorder, we're highly tuned to those energies. I'm constantly getting all of this information just by looking you in the eyes. Well, this was a problem, as you can imagine, because I wasn't sitting in class. I was sitting next to 40 vibrating souls, <laughs> constantly broadcasting all of the time, constantly communicating. Now, as I spent time in the principal's office, we became, he became my principal. <laughs> Thank you. If that's the joke that you love best, fine, you can have it. <laughs> and uh, he enabled me to get into this school. And I didn't get in. I was on probation. I, you know, you failed a couple classes, and then you went on probation. I started college on probation. <laughs> And while on probation, I found out that they were looking for a school mascot, someone to run around in the costume. What a good place for me to channel said energy, right? <laughs> so I put on this costume, and I roamed this campus for three years, four times a week, in that costume. Now, with attention deficit dis oh, it's still funny to you? OK. <laughs> As I roamed this campus in that costume, remember, I still had that ADD thing. I was still picking up all of the signals that everyone was broadcasting all of the time. But you did not know who was in the costume. Mascots do not speak. They're just supposed to be the character, right? You didn't know if I was a man or a woman. All you knew was the energy that I was sharing with you in return. Now, let me tell you, in my three years, I hugged a lot of competitors. 
I hugged a lot of policemen and bullies, children, you name it. Everybody wanted to be hugged while I was in that costume. And I loved it. I loved it. Because I realized something amazing. That all of us, all of us want to be loved. That's it, really. <laughs> what was a problem became a gift. I realize what it is we all need. Now, fortunately, this is not new information. I think we've heard this before. And it's actually how I ended up in the career of branding. Because businesses, they don't just want to make stuff and sell it to you. They want you to love it. They want you to be passionate about it. They want you to tell your friends and family about it. Businesses know that if you love them, you will prefer them. Nonprofits, too. Our firm donates 10% of its services to nonprofits. Yes, nonprofits need branding as well, because you cannot donate to an organization you do not know exists, right? Nonprofits want to be loved as well. How about political institutions? Of course. They absolutely understand this concept, that if people do not only not know who you are, but don't know what you stand for, there will be no connection. The challenge became that as soon as we figured this out, everybody started broadcasting. I mean, everybody. Have you been on an airplane lately? They're constantly playing commercials. Walk through the shopping mall, someone's going to be yelling at you. Drive on the freeway, someone is going to try to get your attention with signs and billboards. This wasn't a problem 100 years ago, because there weren't that many signs, there weren't that many billboards. Today, my god. Everybody is broadcasting all of the time, right? Constantly. It doesn't matter where you go. It doesn't matter what you do. Someone is trying to get you to love them. I respect the need. But then social media showed up. Like, OK, we were already broadcasting at full volume. And then social media showed up. I was on a speaking tour in Central America last month, and I happened into Panama. And while I was in Panama, I was heading through the streets, get a sense of the community, and I walked into the lo local fish market where I met this man. I do not speak Spanish. He does not speak English. But the minute I locked eyes with him, he handed me a piece of paper. That piece of paper had his Twitter and Facebook handles on it. <laughs> so that I could stay abreast of this small boat fisherman's latest sea cockroach catch. All right? This is what people are using to communicate every single day. I think that you recognize that everybody now has the weapon of mass communication, right? Everybody, all of us, all of the time, we can constantly broadcast at full volume. So my, let me get back to the point. If we're just randomly broadcasting, if we're just saying whatever, whenever we feel like it, no one's going to remember us. So what do we do? Well, we say, well, I, I, I work in this business, or, or I, I facilitate programs with this nonprofit, right? That's what we say. But I have to ask you, are you a combination of where you work and your nonprofit? Is that what you are? Work might be what you do, but it's not, definitely not who you are as a person. And of course, we have all these other systems to define each other, right? Oh, how old are you, right? Or what is your race? What is your sex? This is not inaccurate data, but it's definitely not the whole story. Take a look at things like faith. Faith does not come with rules. It comes with all of the people who existed when the rules were created. All of their, all of their stories, all of their energies told in a memorable scope so that you cannot forget. The rules are present, but what we engage is what it's wrapped in. Take food as an example, right? We don't just eat boring food. See, there's Sad Strauss again, right? We don't eat boring food. No, no. We like food that smells good, tastes good, right? The food is just designed to satiate our needs so that we can continue living as an organism. No, no, no. We want to enjoy it. We want to engage it, right? We want things wrapped in love. We want to feel connected to the choices we make. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this, this is what branding is. Branding is, <clears throat> if I want people to remember me, I need to be explicit and consistent about my story. But if you are the story, 
You are what I'm supposed to believe in. You have to continue to ask yourself, what is it that I am broadcasting? What is it that I am putting out into the world so that maybe, maybe in the midst of all of this chaos of noise, remember, we were already broadcasting at full volume, then social media shows up and completely overwhelms our consciousness, everybody with the weapon of mass communication. If, by chance, your voice is heard, if, by chance, you break through, and I pick up the signal, I catch it, I hear it, I'm asking you, what do you want me to remember about you? Do you want me to remember what you do professionally? Is that, is that the memory you want me to have? I don't think that it is, and this is why I'm going to show you a short clip. This is our dog, Olive. She's a five-month-old puppy, and I think she's a perfect example of what it is that I need to hear from you. I haven't had her that long, but I'm definitely falling in love with her. And you're about to, too. Look at this. Do you see what this is? <laughs> the reason why we like babies and puppies and things to that effect is because they are pure, unadulterated life force. They're just being present. They're not worrying about your political agenda or how much money you think that they should make. They're just being purely present. That's it. That's why you don't even need to know her, and you almost fell in love. There was a time in our past called the Middle Ages. We all know it as the Dark Ages. It was when, for hundreds of years, our society, our species, was cloaked in darkness, dark energies. People were dying of everything. <laughs> and as we recognized that we needed to take control over this situation, how did we break free from the Dark Ages? We called it the Renaissance. We called it a time that our pure energies became present, where we created art and culture and engaged each other on a much deeper level. I think that the last three years on this planet have been a new Dark Ages. I think that what has happened to the banks and to the governments and everyone else in between is the same thing that caused me to have a torturous youth in the 80s. which is that you didn't know you were broadcasting in that classroom, but I picked up what you were communicating. You weren't happy. You were frustrated. You lived by other people's rules, rules that you did not create. You did what you were told to do, not what you were driven to do. And that is why we didn't understand each other, because I knew exactly who you were. I think that the reason why our governments and our financial systems and our faiths are all in turmoil is because they are not broadcasting the truth. I think that they're packaging things in obscure ways just to sort of distract you. And imagine in this cacophony of noise, right? Remember, everyone's communicating all of the time and we all have the weapon of social media. So if and when you are to break through, I think that you need to show up. I think that you and I are going to usher in a time that I am going to call the new renaissance. Our renaissance, our time, where I will be honest with you and you will be honest with me. We're not going to obscure each other's understandings. We're not going to have a falsified broadcast anymore. Clearly, the planet can't handle it. Clearly, our citizens are dying because of it. I think that now is our time. And the only person I want to show up is you. I want to know and love you. Thank you. <laughs>